Hi everyone, welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole and on today's episode, we're talking about the importance of physical movement and exercise for children's brain health and behavior. We know that physical activity is really critical for supporting proper brain development, not only in young children, but even as they go through the elementary and middle school and high school ages. Unfortunately, today's kids are more sedentary than ever before in history. And there can be significant barriers to kids with special needs engaging in physical activity um, and exercise. And to help us understand all of this and talk with us about this today and to provide us with some strategies, I've invited Daniel Stein, owner of Special Strong, on the show. Let me tell you a little bit about Daniel. He's been involved in the fitness industry for over 10 years and has owned his own private training business since 2013. His passion for health and fitness led him to get certified through NASM, NFPT, and ACSM. He also holds a specialty certification as a certified inclusive fitness trainer and as a certified autism trainer, which allows him to train individuals with both physical and intellectual disabilities. In 2013, Daniel married his beautiful wife, Trinity, and they now have two kids, by the way. Um, and a few years later, they prayerfully started Special Strong to pursue their calling of working with the special needs population. In his spare time, he enjoys working out, reading, and fishing. Daniel, such a pleasure to have you here. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. This is such an important topic and one that I think tends to get neglected in the realm of thinking about um, strategies and supports for kids with special needs, whether those are uh, physical needs, um, mental health needs, behavioral needs. Um, you know, we all say, oh yeah, we know it's important to move. Our kids should be getting physical activity, but it really goes beyond just the physical benefits of that. And, that, and that's what I want to dig into with you today. Um, but before we start with all of that, I'd love to hear a bit about your story. How did you come to be doing the kind of really unique work that you're doing today? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I was four years old, I was diagnosed with uh, severe ADHD, which is a learning disability. And so I had a really hard time in school. My parents didn't really know what to do. They put me on medication. I got counseling. Uh, I got actually got a lot of different types of therapy. Uh, but when they got me involved in sports, they noticed a really big improvement in my behavior and my, my focus and my learning ability uh, in the classroom. And so um, when they saw that, they thought, you know, let's go ahead and, and buy them a gym membership. So uh, in middle school, they bought me a gym membership to the YMCA. And I'd ride my bike uh, two miles to the gym and two miles back home just about every day. And that's where I uncovered my passion uh, for exercising and working out. Um, it, it radically transformed my life. You know, I, I didn't know at the time the benefits of exercise, but what I was finding for myself was it was making me feel better. Uh, I was able to focus better. And so um, as a result, the quality of my life improved drastically. And so um, at an early age, I knew that I wanted to be a personal trainer. I knew that I wanted to pursue fitness for the rest of my life. It was, I was fortunate to, uh, to uncover my passion at a very early age. Mm -hmm. and, and so I pursued that. Um, all throughout middle school and high school, I studied everything that I could. I, I learned at, uh, learned as much as I could, more like as a hobby. And then after high school, I pr pursued it uh, vocationally. And so I became certified. And um, as I got certified and I started working with the general population, you know, I started realizing, you know, real quick that I had a lot of success with that population. But there was another population that, I, that was dear to my heart, which was the special needs population. As I mentioned earlier, I was diagnosed at age four with ADHD. And when it came to the general population, I wasn't really able to help them with the same things that I overcame, um, being the mental and different struggles, emotional struggles I had. And I knew I wanted to help that population. So that's what ultimately led me to start Special Strong was because I realized that there's very little resources, very little education out there when it comes to fitness and even nutrition for special needs. Now, if you're, if you're a general population, there is unlimited resources at your fingertips. I mean, Google is awesome and you can find just about anything you want for free on Google for yourself. But if you've got a kid with autism, Down syndrome, CP, good luck trying to find information, quality information out there on the internet because it's not there. So that's, we, we created that solution, uh, for which, which was very needed for, the, for this population. I love how you uh, brought your personal experience as a child into what you're doing now as an adult. That's so powerful. And I would imagine that that really 
helps you build um, an immediate connection with the kids and, and the young adults that you're working with, because you're not just talking to them about, oh, these are things that you should do. I'm going to show you how. It's like, here's my story. that This has helped me. I've, I've been where you are. That's exactly right. Yeah. There, there's, a, there's a strong why yeah. behind what I do. It's, um, it's, it's so much more than just a workout. It's, uh, it's something that I've, I've dealt with for a long time. And I, I understand in many ways the struggles these parents have on, an, on, a, on a very personal level. Absolutely. And, you know, I think um, as you were talking about your experience of getting involved with a gym membership, riding your bike two miles, it, it brought to mind many patients that I've worked with over the years where when we can get them engaged and buying into that kind of level of physical activity, as you said, it really is life changing for them. Um, especially as they get into more of those later elementary, middle school, high school years to realize I have some control over this. I have some things I can do yep. um, getting on my bike, getting to the gym. And, and they do, they report back and they're like, I can't believe how much better I feel. I can't believe how much better I'm doing in school. Um, and it's just such a powerful thing that I think we, we too often underestimate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk about, I, I want to get into some nitty gritty with, you know, types of movement and things, but let's just talk in a general way um, about why movement is important. I think most people, when they think about movement, I tend to use movement, exercise can be a dirty word to a lot of people, right? Like, don't talk to sure. me about exercise. So I tend yeah. to talk about it as physical movement, but whatever word we use, um, I think that most of the time people put that in the category of, oh, that's something that we should do for our physical health, right? right? Um, and so I think that's sometimes why it gets ignored for kids because we're generally, I mean, although unfortunately more and more now, we're more concerned about things like obesity and type two diabetes and things like that for even young kids. But in general, we don't worry as much about those physical health things for kids. Um, but, but really, the benefits of movement and exercise go way beyond the physical, right? And so I'd love to have you talk a bit about why movement is so important beyond just the obvious physical benefits. Yeah, absolutely. And I would have to agree with you. And, and like myself, when I started working out at an early age, um, I had no idea that movement was, uh, of course, it helped heal the body physically. We all know that it helps with the body. Um, but I had no idea that uh, movement would actually heal the brain and heal my brain specifically. I had no idea. And um, for, the, for, the, for the audience, I wanted to start by recommending a phenomenal book because um, it would take hours to get into the benefits of the brain with um, what this does. But there's a great book out there called Spark. And it's a phenomenal book. Uh, you may have heard of it, Nicole. It's a best-selling book. It is full of um, peer-reviewed medical studies on what exercise does for the brain, what movement does for the brain. And it's unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable what it does. You know, at one point, um, you know, scientists, doctors, they used to think the, 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 the brain was, um, was incapable of uh, being moldable. And so over the years, it's, it's, it's amazing that they've discovered that the brain uh, is very much moldable. They call it neuroplasticity. And so there's, there's no question, there's no argument now that the brain can, can, can literally rebuild and rewire itself um, to the point where the brain physically actually changes. And one of the best ways to do that is through exercise. And believe it or not, there's actually specific exercises and specific types of exercises that can help the brain in more ways than others. And so as a company, that's one of the things that we focus on is yes, we do traditional resistance training and strength training movements. Of course we do that, but there's a way to make um, exercises more complex because the key is complex movements. Complex movements are going to engage the brain in very unique ways that are going to allow clients like what we've seen um, do things for the first time in their life. Like, you know, have jobs independently, you know, take dishes from the sink and transfer them to the dishwasher. And let me tell you something. We don't have dishes or dishwashers in gyms. Okay. So when we train someone in the gym, we're not showing them how to, how to do dishes, but the movements that we do translate into everyday activities. And when their brains get restored, when their brains start to heal, 
suddenly things that we're doing into the gym translate into things like doing, doing the dishes. Mm -hmm. And we've seen so many things like that where their brains just start functioning and firing the way they're supposed to. You know, we've seen, uh, we've seen clients get off depression medication. You know, um, they call actually, they actually call exercise uh, nature's natural antidepressant. And in some ways, it actually outperformed antidepressants in, um, in placebo studies. I mean, and way, way outperformed them. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, I could go on and on with the studies and the data, but the bottom line is you've got to do it. If you don't do it, it's, you're, you're never going to see the benefits. And that's, that's where we come in as a company is people don't know where to start. You know, how do I motivate my son? How do I motivate my daughter? Hey, Daniel, this all sounds great, but you don't understand. My, my son, my daughter, they hate movement. They hate exercise. How am I supposed to get them to do that? You know, we hear that all the time, and those are the clients we love to work with because we, we, we're able to unlock their potential and help them realize they do like exercise. We've just got to make it and, and, and translate it into a way that, that communicates to them, their, their, their love language, so to speak, their exercise language. I love that. Sounds like that could be the title of a book. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the book Spark. That's, uh, that's Dr. John Rady's book, right? Yep. Spark. Yes, ma'am. So, yep. Yeah wonderful book and you're right covers so much of the research behind this in one place and and you know the fact that there is so much research um i don't think people are aware of that you know it's like movement and exercise it's not just a nice to do it really is a we need to do it in order to keep our brains functioning well and that's for all of us but particularly for kids who are having challenges as you said the benefits of that neuroplasticity, and we can see that on, um, you know, sc brain scans now. We can see the difference um, of how kids' brains wire up, how parts of the brain work together, how their functioning improves. Um, you know, once they're engaged in these kinds of movement and exercise routines, um, and and the depression, the mental health connection. You know, when I educate parents and kids on this. Um, they'll often say, well, if exercise outperforms antidepressants most of the time, like why didn't our physician say this? And, and you know, I say, well, first of all, people don't know what they don't know, but also there is a common um, way of thinking out there among the medical community that people don't want to hear this, right? Sure, they just sure. want to take a pill. They don't want to exercise. And I find, at least in my client population, they're very open to hearing what else they can be doing um, whether instead of medication or in conjunction with medication to help it work better. And physical activity is hands down one of the best things for improving mental health across the board. And we've got studies with depression, with anxiety, with you know bipolar, all kinds of mood disorders, schizophrenia, all of those types of things. And yet it doesn't get the, the publicity, right? People aren't That's right. Yeah. That much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The um, I I don't want to bash doctors because not all doctors are equal, and there are good doctors out there who do prescribe med or who do prescribe exercise as a part of their regimen. But book on healing the brain right now, and you know it's unfortunate. You know, there's a gentleman diagnosed with Parkinson's, mm -hmm. and uh, he started exercising on his own for many years, and he ends up going back to the doctor, and uh, almost all of his symptoms were completely gone. And um, so he actually started to write a book about how exercise helped him with his Parkinson's and he wanted his doctor to endorse his book. And um, the doctor refused to endorse the book. And not only that, but the doctor said, you were actually never accurately diagnosed to begin with. In other words, because of this progress you've seen for two years, what that's telling me is there's no way exercise can do that. And we must have misdiagnosed you to begin with. And that's how that ended. It was really um, it's frustrating for me to read because I've seen a lot of doctors. And one of the most important things I've learned as a patient to doctors is you've got to be a self-advocate. You have to do the research for yourself. If the doctor says something, listen to it. They went to medical school, but it doesn't mean that they're always going to have the final answer. You have to research it for yourself. Look into exercise. Look into exercise with and without medicine, the, the pros, the cons. You have to do that kind of stuff. You absolutely have to. Absolutely. Being your own best advocate and, and yep. for all the parents being your child's best advocate because nobody cares more about your child and the outcomes for them over the course of their life than you do. Yep. Um, 
such great, great stuff. So I think we've convinced people exercise is an important thing to be thinking about with their child. As you brought up, there can be many barriers to that, right? So motivation being a big one, not knowing where to start. I think too, um, for parents who are listening, who maybe have kids with some uh, either mild to severe uh, physical impairment, balance issues, those can be barriers. Talk a bit about some of, some of the most common obstacles or barriers that, that you see in your work that, that kind of keep people, families from pursuing this kind of thing for their child. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the biggest thing that we see, parents are very skeptical, you know, especially if a parent has tried uh, certain sports in their kids' lives um, and they've, you know, for whatever reason, they've unenrolled from that sport. Maybe the, the child uh, lost interest. Maybe they didn't excel in the sport. And so when they, they kind of categorize any type of physical activity as, as the same. So in other words, you know, if this activity didn't work over here, then, then why would lifting weights and, and going to the gym work any differently? So there's, there's some skepticism. And then, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I hear um, and the biggest objection that I have to overcome as a company is um, I don't think my child can do this. Mm -hmm. they, they, they see our videos, you know, we're, we're huge on social media. We have, uh, you know, close to 50 to hundred thousand followers. So every, people see us mm -hmm. and they see videos and they say, there's no way my son or daughter could ever do that. And um, that's really sad by the way. Very, very sad. But at the same time, it's understandable because um, you know, they, they just don't know what they don't know. And so um, I have so much respect for the parents who are willing to give it time and who are willing to try it because it can be fearful. It can be, um, it can be very hard for a parent to say, you know, my son could get hurt. You know, my daughter could get hurt. I don't want him to get hurt. Not to mention we've actually working over uh, with over a thousand clients. We've never, not once had an injury, mm -hmm. not once. Mm -hmm. So I have a respect for the parents who are willing to do whatever it takes and willing to try new things because there are other ways to motivate their kids or children that not only ends up motivating them, but we see the entire tr family transformed. Um, I, I've seen it start with the, the children because the parents, they've got so much on their plate, you know, special needs children. Um, you know, unfortunately they take more care. They take more demand than someone who's neurotypical. So the parents get neglected. We see it all the time, all the time. And the, so they, these parents invest in services, training, fitness, and then they don't do anything for themselves, but their kids, their lives end up getting transformed and they see their kids and it actually translates up. We see it all the time. All of a sudden parents starting to go on nutrition plans. I've got a mom and dad over collectively, the whole family has lost over a hundred pounds. It started with the son, oh, so the son, yeah, son, 17 years old, nonverbal autism started with him mm -hmm. and it translated up to the whole family. So, um, you know, to answer your question, I know that was a long winded, winded answer, but the, the, the bottom line is, Parents are just, they just don't know how to motivate their kids. They just don't know how to get them to do things. Um, that's, that's a big barrier that I've seen. I love that you're talking about the family involvement piece because to me, that's one of the awesome things about incorporating movement into treatment plans is it's something that everybody can do together, yep. which gets so many benefits beyond just the movement, right? Families spending time together, parents improving their health. It just, like you said, sort of, um, you know, has this cascading effect on everybody, which I think is awesome. Um, I want to touch on something that you said that I think is important there about, you know, parents see maybe the videos or what other people are doing and they go, oh my gosh, my kid could never do that. And I know we're going to get into, you know, some of the ways to start, but um, I think that that's really insightful what you said around that because I can see how that would bring up a lot of fears or, or objections. But the idea that just like with anything, you start where the kid is at, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that when you said that, it, it made me think of a 16 year old that I work with who is morbidly obese from mm -hmm. medications that he's been on for a long time from poor eating habits. And, you know, I had gotten him to the point by the beginning of last summer where it was like, let's start thinking about now some movement and you know he was terrified of it he's embarrassed he you know um doesn't know where to start so we just started with even a little bit of walking as a starting point to build some confidence and, and i think that idea for for parents of 
we have to start where the child is at and grow from there. Um, you can't expect a kid to suddenly like head to the gym and be doing, these, right. you know, intense workouts, but, but starting where they're at. Right. That's exactly right. You know, and to your point, you know, like just give you a practical example. Um, <laughs> You know, some of the things that I just posted a video last week and um, it, I think it had maybe 50,000 views, maybe 100,000, which is which is decent. And, um, you know, it was a client um, doing a single leg step up on a TRX, which can look very intimidating, very intimidating. If you don't, if you've never seen a TRX, it may look intimidating. If, if your son or daughter has balance problems, it would look intimidating. But ironically, this client, um, just a few months before that, was wheelchair bound for eight years. So he was literally never got out of his wheelchair. Well, that's not true. He would get out of his wheelchair, but it would of course be with the assistance of parents, but he was wheelchair bound and anywhere he went, he would roll himself in the wheelchair for eight years. He started seeing us major transformation. And now you see him doing these TRX single leg step ups on a, you know, that's requiring a lot of balance. And you just would have never known if you would have seen him where he's come from. So to your point, Nicole, everybody starts differently and i think that's so that's you know one of the things that we do before we do any kind of workout plan is we do a very thorough evaluation and um, that just helps us know where somebody's starting at and you know the great thing for parents wanting to do this on their own is they know their kids better than anybody else you know the evaluation is, uh, when we do evaluations it's not for the parents it's for us you know but in the case of the parents they, they don't necessarily need a thorough evaluation they've been living with their children for many many years they they know their gait they know their walking pattern they know their strengths they know their weaknesses so they don't need this long evaluation they can just start in a very very simple basic way that's going to be um you know that's going to work for their kids you know to your point um everyone's got to start somewhere and there is a very good safe and effective way for just about everyone uh, where they can start. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. There's a safe and effective way for everybody to get started. That should really be um, the key takeaway for people, right? Is that doesn't matter what the diagnosis is, doesn't matter what kind of shape the person's in, doesn't, doesn't matter. There is a safe and effective place for everybody to start. I love that. Let's Absolutely. dive into a little bit then. What are some of the best movements to start somebody with? Or in general, do you have a couple of recommendations or maybe a place that you do start with people? Yeah, so whenever I start with new clients, my, my first goal with starting with a new client is I wanna build that relationship with the client. And this would be with the parents too. Um, you're wanting to establish with the client or the individual that um, there's a sense of trust there. So the, the most important thing to start with are exercises that are going to build their confidence. Um, because if you start them with an exercise that's too complex in the beginning, you're setting them up to fail. And especially with so many of the, our, our population, you know, they, they have this perfectionism mm -hmm. thing, thing going on. And so the worst thing you can do is, is start them at, with something like, you know, like a body weight squat if they already have trouble bending their knees or sitting down properly, you probably wouldn't want to start them with that. I mean, in theory, it's a good idea, but again, you want to, the first initial part you want to do is build their confidence with very simple exercises. And practically one of my favorite things to do when I start with any client is what's called a farmer's walk. And parents will appreciate this because um, if successfully mastered, it'll help a lot when it comes to groceries and bringing in groceries from the car to the house. So a farmer's walk is very simple and you can use uh, just about any weight. You know, I recommend probably about five to 10 pounds per hand. And it's really simple. You're just, you know, you're going to lift your chest up, you know, have your shoulder blades back and you're just going to carry weight in each arm and you're going to do it uh, while walking. And so um, you'll determine a very healthy pace as far as how far to walk. You could do it for time. That's probably the best way to do it is a 30 second, you know, walk back and forth. Um, but that's a really simple exercise and believe it or not, it's, it's actually really functional. I mean, you have to, you have to really engage a lot of your body um, just, to, just to have those weights in your hand. And it's also really easy to progress. You know, you can go from two hands to one hand. So you put, instead of having it uh, on equal distribution, now you can put all the weight in one hand. So there's a little bit of an imbalance. And uh, now your body's got to compensate for that imbalance because you've got 20 pounds on one side and nothing on the other side. 
And again, easy way to build confidence, but also a very functional movement. I mean, I promise you I could get somebody sweating if I wanted to within about five to 10 minutes of a farmer's walk. Um, but again, sim very simple exercise requires very little cognitive functioning. It's literally just holding weight and walking. And just about everybody who's ambulatory should be able to do that, 95%. <laughs> Yeah, and I love that you can start out with as little weight as you need to yep. and move up in as little time. So to your point, the ability to, you know, gauge that with what the child can do and starting there is great. And yes, the functionality of that is so um, huge for so many things. And, and I love what you said about building confidence because I, I do think that's just key with everything with these kids, right? Especially, as you said, the ones who just have experienced so much failure or feelings of incompetence or who are afraid to try anything if they think it's not gonna be perfect, um, you know, right out of the gate to build that confidence by giving them something relatively simple that right off the bat, they can feel like, oh, I did this, this is gonna be okay. Yeah, absolutely, that's so true. And um, another go-to exercise that I'd like to mention too, that's um, very good for building confidence is um, something that they probably already do on a daily basis. You know, we all we all drop things on the floor or for whatever reason, we have to pick things up off the floor. I mean, that's, I don't care who you are, you're gonna have to, at some point you're gonna be on the floor, you're gonna have to bend your knees and pick something up. So a great way to use that in, in the form of fitness um, is, is something uh, called a medicine ball slam. We absolutely love this movement. And um, this, is, um, this is a little bit more complex than a farmer's walk, but, it is more of a brain exercise. It's classified as a top to bottom exercise. And so um, there is, a, um, a, there is a, a crossing over the midline by doing a uh, top to bottom exercise. So this is when you, you really start to engage the brain a little bit more. And it's real simple. You're just picking up a ball and slamming it down and picking it back up off the floor and repeating that. And um, that's another one. It, it's actually one of those that's it's it's um, it's a little bit more complex, but it's also a lot of fun. The kids will have a lot of fun. They get to throw a ball as literally as hard as they want, um, and it'll never break. And you can I, I like to tell I like to I, I have fun with it. I'll tell them, hey, listen, if you break this open, I'll give you a hundred dollar bill. And they'll go crazy. They go crazy over it. And I've thankfully I've never had to give a hundred dollar bill away. Thank God. But. Um, <laughs> but I would give it away if somebody broke it somehow. Um, so it's, we have fun with it and, um, it's also a great, um, emotional, um, regulator. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the medicine ball slam is phenomenal when it comes to regulating emotions. I mean, I don't need, um, I don't need to explain science to, for you to know that taking your aggression out on a ball is going to help you feel better. I mean, that's, you know, if you've ever, if you've ever seen people hit a wall when they're mad, well, there's a reason they're hitting the wall. I mean, it's getting out their frustration and they're able to express their emotions into, into the wall. And how about instead of breaking a wall, let's, let's take it out on the ball. Because in our case, we do have clients that, that hit walls, they hit doors, they, they do all that kind of stuff. But you translate that into a productive movement, like a medicine ball slam, and now they're getting exercise. And now their, their emotions are also getting regulated. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. Fantastic. And I was also thinking about the sensory integration properties of that too, of, you know, that, that uh, deep pressure and that weight of slamming that down and picking that up and providing that proprioceptive input to the joints, which is also a very regulating thing too. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's numerous benefits um, to exercises like the medicine ball slam, just like you mentioned, the sensory benefits, um, even the vestibular system. I mean, the change in the vestibular system going from your head up to your head down. I mean, that does wonders. I mean, that, that, that's the top to bottom movement that, that we mentioned is that the vestibular system being in the ear and um, that, that change in head movement is amazing what that can do for the brain too. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing just how it's for something very simple can be so profound. Well, and I love that you also are always thinking about how that fits into overall life function right? As you said, you know, these are not just isolated random things, like how often do we need to be able to do that movement of bending down to smoothly, you know, pick something up and come back to standing. That's a functional life movement that gets integrated into life, carrying, um, you know, weight in both hands. So I love that piece of it too, because I think anytime that we are including functional 
um, movements, it, we're just getting extra bang for our buck there, right? It's like we're not just getting the benefits of the physical activity, but as you said, the brain connectivity and really improving life function. Yes, no, absolutely. And, you know, what, what, the neat thing about functional movements are they're very easy to uh, progress, you know. So you start with something like a functional movement, like a, a medicine ball slam. And um, I believe I missed spoke earlier I said that it was um, I was getting it confused but when you when you do a medicine ball slam you're, you're not actually crossing the midline just yet but there is a way where you can progress the movement um, and just to give you an example um, what we do often is um, whenever the ball gets slammed down we'll have people pick it up and we'll have them draw an X in the air with the medicine ball slam so you're crossing over this way and then you're gonna cross over this way so you've now crossed the midline and that and so um, and that again, very. It's a you can build. I love functional movements because you can build off of them, and you can you can build and build and build, and that's how you build someone's confidence. Mm -hmm. Is you you start with a real basic exercise, and then you slowly progress it and build and build of mastery, and then you can introduce real complex movements. Like I mentioned, this gets a little complex, and you've got to go from here to here, crossing the midline. That's really uh, complex for a lot of our uh, a lot of our clients. But again, if you start basic and you work up to that, uh, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing to see, um, see what can be achieved. So this idea of starting where they're at and building their confidence, helping them feel competent with this, I think that's a huge step to um, increasing motivation and willingness to participate, right? What other things do you feel like are important? You know, for parents sitting there going, oh, you know, all my kid wants to do is lie around or he just plays the video games or he doesn't want to move. Um, what are some of the other components that you think are helpful in terms of building motivation for doing physical movement? Yeah, I think there's two components. There's going to be a motivation component um, in the workout itself. And then there's also going to be a motivation component outside of the workout when they're not working out. So what we've seen that's been really successful for our clients outside of the workout is some kind of reward system. And so um, that can look different for everybody. You know, I've got, I've got a client that um, if he comes into the gym and has good behavior, um, you know, for uh, okay behavior or two stickers for really good behavior. And if he does real bad, then he doesn't get any stickers. Um, and that motivates him like crazy. And then those stickers translate for them into allow him to buy things on Amazon. You know, we all love Amazon and, and he loves to shop on Amazon. So um, that really motivates him to come into the gym and also to give it his 100% when he's there. And then when we are actually at the gym and we are working out and we've, we've gotten to that point, uh, we love to use what are called uh, positive reinforcers. And so um, there's a lot of different ways to incorporate that, you know, but um, one, of the, one of my favorite ways to do that um, is fist bumps. And my, my clients love fist bumps. I can get them to do just about every, anything I want just by a simple fist bump. I mean, it's crazy how much they just feed off of encouragement. They love encouragement. So a lot of times what will happen with my clients is we'll finish a set, I'll slam, and right after the set's done, they've got their hand and fist out waiting for me Ready? to fist bump them. <laughs> yeah, that's right, here you go. Give it right back to you, Nicole. And it is so motivating to them and it reinforces what happens is it's a positive reinforcement. So they've done something really well and the positive reinforcement is the fist bump. And so what that tells them is if I do the exercise again like this, I'm going to get another fist bump. On the other hand, if they do something that's maladaptive or that I don't appreciate, they're not going to get a fist bump from me. And what that tells them is that if I do X, X behavior, then guess what? I'm not going to get my fist bump from Daniel anymore. And so you've got to be really delicate with how you handle that. But um, it teaches them that there are consequences for good behavior and consequences for bad behavior. And there's no punishment. It's not necessarily a punishment to take away that hand. But it just tells them, hey, listen, if I want that, if I want that fist, that fist bump, I'm going to have to do it a certain way, the way that my instructor or my parent is telling me to do it. Um, that's one of our favorite ones. Another one we like to do, um, you'll find when you start working with, uh, with your kids or, or with clients that everyone's got their favorite exercise. You'll find it eventually. It may take time, but you're going to find that they like some exercises more than others. And so, you know, like for me, I've, I've got a client who loves jumping jacks, absolutely loves them. 
And so um, sometimes instead of the fist bump, I'll use that positive reinforcer um, as jumping jacks. So after he finishes a set of um, farmer's walks, we'll say, okay, let's do 30 jumping jacks. And that's a positive reinforcer for him to again, do those farmer's walk, the farmer's walks the way that I want him to do it. So um, that's one of the best strategies um, that I can possibly recommend for inside motivation for the gym and then also outside of the gym motivation. Yeah, and I think I like the focus on the positive, right? We just, you know, instead of being um, punishing or focusing on the negative, which let's face it, a lot of these kids, especially if they're in school all day, there tends to be um, a lot of focus on what they're doing wrong. And yep. this is more a focus on spotlighting the things that they're doing well and then building that motivation um, to do that. And I think the relationship is a big part of that too. And to go back to something you said earlier in the interview, you really spend your first, you know, probably several sessions mm -hmm. you know, with mm -hmm. a kid building that relationship, right? Because yep. Yep. when they have that relationship, that goes a long way too to motivating them to want to please you, to want to engage with you in that way. So that piece is important. Yeah, absolutely. It is all about the positive and the praise. And, um, you know, another strategy we use for motivation is uh, behavior specific praise. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be more during the workout itself. But um, let's just use the example since we talked about farmers walks. And we talked about the, um, the medicine ball slam. So let's say that somebody is doing a farmers walk, rather than saying, um, you know, hey, Timmy, great job on the farmer's walk and you know give them a fist bump and you know that that's the end of it instead what you can do is say hey timmy i liked how you kept your chest up and i liked how you kept your hands to your side the entire time great job with the farmer's walk okay so that's going to do way more for motivation and positive reinforcement than just saying hey good job on the farmer's walk because that doesn't mean anything to, to that person if you just say good job not to mention you actually could be reinforcing the wrong things so um, if he did something wrong in the movement and you just told him good job, well, that's a little confusing because he's doing something wrong and you're telling him good job. So uh, again, a tricky, a kind of a creative way you can get around addressing the negative part is just focus on the things he did really good. And if he didn't do something real good, it's okay. You just focus on the things he's doing really good on and then later you can make those corrections. But it's a, it's a much safer way than them having to feel rejection. And then again, that, that performance perfectionism um, kind of kicking in. Yeah, it's a great point. That specific praise is so valuable because it helps them know exactly what part of that to replicate, right? And I find that even, you know, within any kind of activity, a kiddo might have a lot of moments that were not so fantastic, but you can yep. usually find something, you know, yes. within that to give some uh, positive for, and then that keeps the relationship and kind of keeps them motivated. So um, such just really useful, practical um, tips and strategies. Um, I know this information is so helpful to our listeners. I want to make sure that I give you a chance to share a little bit about specifically what you're doing, because while you do have an in-person gym where you train kids and work with families, you've also got some really cool stuff going online that people can access um, to get trained, whether they're a parent or a professional, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. We're doing a lot. We really have a global mindset and a global vision to just educate, um, you know, just really, you know, even outside the United States, we want to educate people. So what we have is a company called Strong Education, and it's uh, CertifyStrong.com. Uh, but what it's, it's designed for parents and professionals to learn how to either work one-on-one -on -one or in groups, uh, group settings with the special needs population. We've created it as, um, as very entry level, so there's no fitness experience required. Um, but even if you already are a professional, you're gonna really benefit a lot from this course. Uh, whereas if you're not a professional, you're just a parent, you're gonna learn a lot with how you can take these things from the course and immediately implement it either in home or if you have a gym, you can implement it at the gym. It's designed for either or. And so um, we, we put it, uh, we, we've been using this, the, this education for years for our company. We've got many trainers who work for us. And what we did for the first few years is we'd put them through this field and, and, and you know, go train clients. And we had a great success rate. And th uh, last year, about mid last year, we decided to make it available to the public, uh, whereas before it was very private and exclusive. 
And um, since making it public, we've certified over 100 people and we formed several, um, probably about eight different national partnerships. So we're credited with uh, seven, seven different agencies. And then uh, we've also got some national partnerships with like Crunch Fitness, which is a huge gym. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's been very, it's been, we've had incredible feedback and success, not only from professionals, but parents are absolutely loving this. Um, they're getting video demonstrations. I mean, they're just getting really practical tools to empower their kids to empower their communities. I've had parents that have wanted to start group classes in their community with, with no credentials. And that's okay. You don't have to be, a, a, you don't have to have credentials um, outside of ours to go start a group class. You just, you don't have to. Our, our, our certification is a strong nationally accredited certification and it allows someone to go, to go do that. Um, so to answer your question, you know, this is a resource that's gonna be great for any parent, any professional, that's wanting to help someone with uh, special needs and fitness. I love it. I was so, so impressed, you know, when I was first introduced to you and looking at what you're doing online and just the, the quality and the caliber of what you've put together um, for parents and professionals to access. So really can't encourage all of you who are listening enough to go check out um, these programs. Give the website, again, it's Certify Strong. Dot com is for the the online programs and then um, is there a separate website for for your gym yeah the the website for our gym is uh, specialstrong.com and we're in the process currently uh, franchising so we're actually looking at starting our first franchise in Louisiana so we have about six locations in Texas but we um, there's been such a high demand so um, we're slowly expanding outside of Texas and our, our, our hope is to be in every state because, um, you know, for the parents that maybe don't have time, they're busy, you know, or they just want that extra professional guidance. You know, we, we want to be there to help because we, we understand that, um, that sometimes you need a little bit more than just watching some videos and trying these things at home. Sometimes you need that extra accountability. And so um, that's why one of the things outside of Texas uh, just to be a solution to more families. Love it. So excited about what you're doing. Um, Daniel, thank you so much for being on the show today and providing all of this valuable information to our listeners. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nicole. And thanks to all of you for listening to the show today. We'll see you next time for our next episode of The Better Behavior Show.